So let's go bananas today. And I don't use the term in the sense of going crazy, nor I rather use the term to refer to faults in functional programming. So you know faults already, like for list processing based on uh, this higher order combinator fold L or fold R. So we will mainly focus on fold R today and we will try to understand how fold R helps us, for example, with parallel data processing and also how we can generalize fold R to process, you know, data structures other than lists. So here's the seminal paper on the subject of recursion schemes for list processing and potentially other data types. And you know, if you want to read up on some theoretical foundations, this is your paper. Um, but I bring it up here because it really helps us understanding why people sometimes say banana rather than fold. So in this kind of paper, uh, you know, the authors like Eric Meyer and others would use these banana brackets rather than the fold R operator when they would want to form a fold. So this is why we say banana sometimes because of this notation. And uh, if you want to read this paper, please go ahead, but you know, be aware of the possibility to get serious headache. Okay, so basically in the first part of this presentation here, I want to recall some uh, simple uses or, and perhaps also not so simple uses of fold R to prepare us for some advanced topics such as parallel data processing and uh, processing data structures other than lists. So here's some simple use, like we might want to compute the sum of the elements in a list, or we might want to compute uh, the product of all elements in a list. And it turns out that these two functions, sum and product, can be uh, you know, defined in terms of fold R. So basically what we do here is, in, in the case of sum, we have to uh, reduce all the elements in the list by repeated application of binary addition and we start from zero. In the case of product, we repeat the application of binary multiplication and we start from one. And here is the uh, type and the definition of fold R. So what I want to point out is uh, these two first arguments of fold R because these are the arguments that tell fold R how to replace the non-empty versus the empty list constructor when folding over a list. So this is also illustrated with this little example up here, where we try to understand how fold R is applied uh, in the context of computing the sum. So we have this list here, so we have those applications of the non-empty list constructor and also one application of the empty list constructor. And now when we fold over the list with binary addition and uh, using zero as the uh, you know, replacement of the empty list constructor. Well, we basically get this tree with those pluses and this zero instead of this tree with those non-empty versus empty list constructor applications. This is how fold R works, right? And so let's actually uh, try to generalize the scenario a little bit that we just had now with you know product and sum, where we basically were reducing a list. Uh, based on appropriate operations. Well, the general scenario here is that we use a algebraic data structure of a monoid uh, for such reduction. So a monoid has a associative operation on the type in question and a so-called mapend and the identity of that binary operation. So I also summarize the resulting algebraic laws down here. So once we have two such operations on a given type, then we can actually use that money directly to fold over a list to actually reduce uh, the list to one value of the monoid. So, you know, if you just rework the examples that we just have seen for sum and product, this is what we get. For example, we uh, define a helper data type sum here that represents a monoid for summing up values. And so we define it on top of any number type and then the binary operation mapend is addition indeed, and the identity for that binary operation is uh, the constant zero indeed. And then, you know, likewise, we define a monoid product. But then, I mean, obviously, fold R is not restricted to just this sort of reduction. Uh, we can also map over a list. Mapping meaning here that we perform an operation per element but we preserve the shape of the list otherwise. For example, here 
we do increment um, the elements in the list. And here we compute a Boolean from each element in the list, whether or not the element is odd. And so here is the type of map. And it reflects that the uh, element type of the input list might be different from the element type of the output list. So we got a parameter here, a to b, which is the uh, per element function that we apply um, to transform each element. And so it turns out that map can also be defined in terms of fold r. So this is cool, right? So far, we really just use fold r all over the place. And uh, so how is map defined in terms of fold r? Well, we say that we replace the empty list by the empty list, okay? And then essentially the non-empty list is also sort of replaced by the non-empty list constructor, but only after processing the head of the card list with the argument function f. So, you know, just by the shape of this definition, having a non-empty list constructor here, an empty list constructor there, it's clear that this instance of fold r actually preserves the list shape, right? So let's continue. So, you know, let's add effects to mappings. For example, with this example here, again, we want to increment all the elements in the list. But in addition, we want to use a state monad to carry around a counter so that we can count how many times we have actually incremented some element. So we use this kind of tick helper here to apply incrementing uh, in a kind of side effectful way so that we uh, uh, update a counter, okay? So how's tick defined? Well, it takes this pure function x to y, and in our case, this is the increment, and then we take indeed an x, and then we do not just return a y, rather we return a computation of y, which in our case uh, is a stateful computation, right? So what we do here is we first look up the current state, which in our case is the counter value, and then we increment that state and we put it back and then we perform uh, the uh, pure computation, right? So we apply f to x. And so here's the definition of map m, which we used up there. So the nice thing here is that again, map m can be defined as an instance of fold r. So how is map m defined? Well, uh, k uh, says how to replace the empty list. We replace it with the trivial computation of the empty list. How is the non-empty list uh, re replaced? Well, we first uh, process the head using g, the argument of map m. We process the head and in fact this uh, gives us a computation so all these computations are now lined up uh, through bind so we get the result of the computation y. Now we also line up uh, the, the tail of the list, well the recursive application of fold here, so we also line it up with bind and so we get back the uh, tail, the processed tail of the list and so we reconstruct the non-empty list up here and uh, that's it. Well, so we just have seen mapping with monadic effects and some of you might know that these days people also like to use applicative functors instead of monads for effects. So, you know, let me just briefly show that this also works out again in the sense that the corresponding map combinator can again be defined in terms of fold R. So we just vary the previous example in, in a very tiny way. So we use, uh, you know, the applicative functor version of the map operator here. So which in fact doesn't use return and bind, but it rather uses pure and disapply. So, so you see it resembles much more the function application idea of applicative functors. So basically the empty, the non-empty list constructor is applied to the process head, is in turn applied to the recursively processed tail, as opposed to having any sort of bind sequence here, right? So I also show the uh, signature of an applicative functor down here, pure being very similar to return, whereas this apply uh, operation here being more a generalization of function application as opposed to the monadic bind, which essentially sequentializes computations. So let's look at a few more uses of fold R. So for example, let's compute the length of a list. And of course, that is an instance of fold R. What we do is we just map uh, each element in the list to one. So we are oblivious to the type 
and the value of the element. We just count each element as one and then we just add up all those ones and we start from zero. Or let's filter a list. So in this case, we want to filter a list uh, to determine those uh, elements that are odd. So this is how we define filter, okay? And here's yet another example, let's reverse a list. So we get that sort of list. And how do we define reverse? Well, we can try to define reverse in terms of fold R. It's not too hard. What we do here is, well, we replace the empty list by the empty list. And for the non-empty list, what we do is we take the head of that list and we form a singleton list from it. And then we just uh, receive the recursively reverse tail of the current list and we append together that recursive result and the head of the list. However, as you see, we're using the append operation in each step here. And that's clear that this is going to be inefficient, right? So this brings up naturally the discussion of fold R versus fold L. So fold R is called fold R because those parentheses are sort of, you know, aligned to the right. And uh, with fold L, it's just the opposite. So it turns out if we have fold L available, then uh, we can give a much more efficient definition of uh, reverse, right? So you see that the use of append in each step of folding here is gone. And so this brings up the issue how to define fold L and whether we really need fold L uh, in some cases. So I just show here the types of fold R versus fold L for comparison. Anyway, the point is that fold L again can be defined in terms of fold R and the definition is a little bit scary, so I leave it out here, but you know, there's a further reading pointer that covers this story. But you know, the bottom line is that even fold L can be defined in terms of fold R if you really have to. And then, so what remains here is that everything we have seen so far can be defined in terms of fold R. Okay, so this brings us to sort of an intermediate summary, so we now understand the uh, the role of fold R. It's you know its generality, its expressiveness. So let's try to push the story towards you know uh, abstract lists, for example. So you know so far we have dealt with concrete Haskell lists. Can we deal with other kinds of lists, container types? And then let's see how we can use. Uh, the beautiful notion of bananas in the context of parallel data processing, uh, where lists, uh, you know, also play a role. And then let's also push the story farther to, you know, process data other than lists. For example, we want to process abstract syntax trees with folds, you know, rather than lists. In object-oriented programming, people know the iterator design pattern. This pattern provides a general solution uh, to the problem of providing a sort of an iteration API for a container-like object structure. For example, if you have a composite, you might want to allow other clients to iterate over the uh, components in the composite. So this idea of coming up with a general solution for iteration, you know, sort of uh, working for any possible container type, is very similar to our quest in generalizing uh, fold R to be applicable also to other Haskell types than just the concrete list type in Haskell. And this is basically uh, what this uh, paper here by Jeremy Gibbons and Bruno Oliveira does. They did generalize fold R to become applicable to other container-like types in Haskell. Okay, so this generalization comes in the form of a bunch of type classes, you know, and each type class picks out a certain usage of fold R and makes it more parametric so that it can be used with other container types. So here's the first uh, type class, functor, uh, with its member fmap, and it's meant to generalize essentially what we know as map for Haskell's concrete lists. So you know that map is meant to allow us to go over the elements in the list and process them one by one, but otherwise preserve the shape of the data structure, right? So, and this is what we want to see generalized here. So we see that we are more general because we have this type constructor here. 
And these are the laws that we want to see satisfied by any valid functor instance. This basically means the first one that if we apply the identity function to each element in the container, well, then we preserve the container uh, altogether. And if we want to apply like two functions to the various elements in the container, well, then we might either compose these two functions and do a single pass with fmap, or we might perform two passes and compose those passes. Okay? And here's a little exercise for you. So you might, in fact, try to instantiate the functor class uh, for your favorite uh, data type, uh, be it, uh, you know, bags or some trees or stacks, whatever. But please try this one. Try to provide a functor instance for ordered sets where we assume that a representation type, uh, you know, uses search trees. So you will find that it's not easy actually to instantiate a functor class, or you might find that you come up with an inefficient implementation of fmap. Okay, so here's the next type class that generalizes another bit of fold all usage. And this type class is basically about uh, reduction, you know, as we have discussed it. In fact, it adds the act of extraction of mono idle values to the plane reduction. So the argument function of fold map here is that we extract a mono idle value from the element type of the container. And then the assumption is that underneath all those extracted mono idle values are reduced, of course, uh, by means of the binary operation of the monoid. And so we see this indeed if you look at the instance for um, foldable for, for the concrete list type. So we fold over the elements in the list by starting from M empty. And in each step, for each kind of non empty list constructor, we process the head of the list with f, say we extract the mono idle value from it, and then we combine that uh, mono idle value with what we have obtained uh, through the recursive folding. And so we use, of course, the binary operation of the monoid to do this combination. Okay, and so there's another type class, and this type class is about uh, mapping with effects. So now, as we have discussed for concrete Haskellists, we might either favor monads or we might favor applicative functors. Let's generalize uh, the, uh, the mapping idea based on applicative functors. So you see, we are again becoming parametric in the uh, container type T here. And we are also parametric, of course, in the effect type F here. And so you see, uh, we generalize basically what we have called map A on a previous slide, say, which is mapping over the elements in a list while um, um, adding applicative functor based effects to that mapping. So let's look at an advanced application of list processing. We want to understand Google's MapReduce programming model and architecture. Uh, so one can use this programming model to do uh, data processing in parallel, and in particular, one can deal with uh, huge volumes of data, right? So, you know, this might be a set of documents that was obtained by a web crawl, and you might want to compute something like an index over the links or the words in the set of documents. And because the uh, input is so huge, what you do is you split up the input uh, so that you have a uh, number of splits stored on different machines, on different file systems. And you have many worker machines in order to carry out the computation uh, in parallel. And in fact, the map reduce computation consists of a map phase and a reduce phase. In a map phase, you basically extract data from the input. For example, you might want to extract words or links occurring in the documents. Whereas in the reduce phase, you basically really build up the index. Okay, so what happens is you have many worker machines running in parallel to perform the map phase, and they perform data extraction and store the uh, intermediate results locally on their hard disks. And then in the reduce phase, you have again 
many uh, reduced workers building the uh, index in parallel. In fact, each reduced worker is responsible for a distinct part of the index. And so basically every uh, map worker may contribute to each part of the index. So therefore it's communication between all these machines here. Anyway, there's also a master machine uh, being responsible for scheduling and all that. Okay, so we want to understand how we can specify uh, this architecture in Haskell. And as you can imagine, fold R plays a major role in that. So here's a simple example. Uh, this is what we want to use as a running example here in um, developing a specification for MapReduce. So we want to build a word index, a uh, word index like this that tells us, okay, appreciate occurred once in the input documents, fold occurred twice in the input documents, and so on. And the code you see here shows us how we can run that computation on some input, right? So we build some input here, we start from the empty set of documents, we insert document number one, this might be the key for the document, into the set of documents and the content of the document is fold to fold and we insert another document, uh, document two, appreciate the unfold into the set of documents and then we apply our map reduce computation subject to specification um, on this input and this is what we get here. Okay, so let's see how we actually program word occurrence count as a MapReduce computation. Okay, so here's the Haskell code for computing the word index. And of course we heavily rely on a reusable skeleton for MapReduce computations here. And we have to provide parameters that describe what to do in the map phase whereas the reduce phase. So in the map phase, we get to see the documents key or URI, we get to see the documents content, and we have to compute trivial word occurrence counts from that document. Uh, more in detail what we do is we split up the content into words and then we map over these words and we pair up each word with one, okay? In the reduce phase, we assume that all the intermediate key value pairs have already been grouped by key. So we only look at all the counts for a given word here, let's say in our example. And we simply have to sum up all these counts. Okay, so now the next interesting question is of course, how does this map reduce look like? So let's look at the specification that are extracted from uh, the MapReduce publication by Google. So here's the type of MapReduce. Let's first look at the input-output behavior. So we take a map or a dictionary and we return a map. And well, or we could also say keyed data, right? So basically input is, uh, you know, a set of documents that are keyed by the document ID, document URI. And, but I, rather than using concrete types here like string, I use type parameters here so that the whole specification becomes a little bit more reusable. So yeah, so we take a set of input documents, let's say, and then we produce uh, some index here. This could be uh, K2 could be uh, our words and V2 could be the counts for these words such as int. Okay, and now let's look at the arguments of MapReduce. So, uh, the map workers uh, will see one key of the input, one value of the input, such a document content, and uh, will compute all these uh, key value pairs here. Okay, and in the reduce phase, a reduce worker gets to see a specific intermediate key, uh, some values that go with these with this key. I mean, possibly rising from different map workers and it has to reduce this list to a single value. So now let's look at the specification and this is really all the code there is. And I'm using of course some functions from the data map module but other than that I'm only using trivial stuff from the Haskell prelude. So this is all there is and there are three phases. So there's a mapping phase, there's a grouping phase and there's a reduction phase. 
In the mapping phase, what we do is we basically apply the argument m to all the, say, documents in the input. And we get many lists of key value pairs out of this application of map, which we just concatenate. In the grouping phase, we want to group all these key value pairs by the intermediate key domain. So therefore, what we do is we basically build up a map. So we key the intermediate data by the intermediate key domain. So we start from the empty map and we insert each key value pair one by one. So uh, this is what we do here. So now it might be that as we hit a key value pair, that key might, may already be present in the map. So what we do is we just concatenate the new value to the existing values for that key. And then finally, when we perform reduction, this is really trivial because we have already grouped all the key value pairs. So we only need to perform reduction uh, per key and there's an appropriate map primitive in the data map module. Okay, so this is sort of nice. What's missing here is, of course, that we don't really talk much about parallelism. So the parallelism is not evident from this specification. So let's improve that. But before that, here's a little exercise for you. You know, you might want to use that specification um, to do a little bit more advanced uh, MapReduce computation. Let's say in addition to just uh, performing uh, um, word occurrence count, uh, you also want to count the number of documents you have seen. So you want to, in, in a way, you want to produce two results, right? So you want to say, you know, how many documents are in the input and uh, what's the word index. So it turns out that this specification is probably not, you know, uh, reusable enough to uh, do that. So perhaps you can uh, suggest an improvement to the specification. Anyway, let's look into uh, a parallel model here. So we want to, you know, we want to add more details to our specification so that we can see how parallel computation could really be achieved. Okay, so we slightly change the type of MapReduce. So the first modification is concerned with the input-output behavior. So you see, we, we, we stop taking just a single map, we rather take a list of maps. So the idea is that this corresponds to the splits that we have seen in the initial figure, right? So there are, you know, the, the documents are scattered over several machines, and this is what the list structure stands for here. And likewise, for the output, we assume that we use many reduce workers to produce the index. So the index is also scattered over several machines. So we get like different parts of the index here uh, as a list. Okay. And now we have to somehow know how many map workers and how many reduce workers we should use. For the number of uh, map workers, what we simply do is we simply assume that we use the number of splits here as an indication as to how many map workers we want to use. Of course, we could do different things, but for the moment, let's assume that we do it like this. But the number of reduced workers is no way uh, evident from uh, the input, right? So what we do here is uh, we just specify the number of reducers um, explicitly. And then we also give a function that sort of partitions the key domain uh, so that we can assign different ranges of the key domain to different reduce workers, okay? And other than that, the uh, arguments uh, M and R haven't changed in their type. Let's look at the specification for the parallel map reduce. So the most uh, interesting aspect is that we have additional applications of map going on here, and those maps directly correspond to the parallelism of the map workers and the reduce workers. So basically each map worker takes one split of the input and performs map per key just as we did in the non-parallel specification. However now we need to prepare the intermediate results to go to different reduce workers. And this is what we do partition for. So partition basically goes over the flat list of key value pairs and turns this into a list of lists. 
I mean, where the outermost list structure corresponds to the different reduced workers. So we use the arguments N and A here, specifying reduction. We use them here in the partitioning step so that we, you know, send the key value pairs to the appropriate buckets for the appropriate reduced worker, right? And so then before we actually communicate those key value pairs to the reduced workers, we do an optional step here, but it really makes sense. That is, we perform local reduction. You know, rather than sending all these trivial where the currents counts over the network, we might already try to reduce where the currents counts as much as possible locally. So we basically perform the same kind of grouping and reduction as we did in a non-parallel specification. So now there is the interesting bit here. So we have to essentially send the different buckets from each map worker to all the uh, reduced workers. So how do we do this? Well, it turns out that, you know, matrix transposition in the sense of the nested list structure that we have here is the appropriate thing to do. So, you know, let's think about this a little bit. So each map worker has a bunch of buckets, one bucket for each reduced worker. So now, to prepare the work of the reduced workers, each reduced worker needs to get its hands on all the appropriate buckets from all the various map workers. And that's exactly what transposition helps us with here. So then once we have transposed this nested list structure here, then we can actually perform a merge on these uh, buckets as they arrived from different map workers. So this is essentially also a grouping step, only that, you know, because we already have a map here, it's much more efficient just to merge these maps rather than to uh, perform, you know, naive grouping. And then we have to reduce per key. Okay, so that's the uh, parallel specification. And you might say uh, it's sort of nice. I mean, actually, it really... Uh, makes you understand how parallelism works in MapReduce. But I figured out that it's actually way too complicated. I mean, it's really the specification you are sort of supposed to come up with when reading the MapReduce paper. But anyway, it's algebraically too complicated, as we will see in a second. And the simplification is actually inspired by another Google paper. Namely, uh, somewhat later, they developed a domain-specific language called SOSL uh, that was claimed to be built on top of the MapReduce architecture. So I looked at this domain-specific language and also on, I looked at this figure that came with the paper and I realized that uh, this actually suggests a much simpler model of MapReduce computations. So, um, the way they explained a SOSL was that they said, okay, uh, this time we imagine to have many racks of uh, machines, and then within each rack, uh, we perform sort of the, the kind of the map step, and we also perform a local reduce step, and then we, in the end, we have some super reducer machine somewhere that combines all these uh, local reduce results. So the point is that this description now suddenly doesn't talk about keys anymore. You know, keys seem to be really important for the basic MapReduce model. And another thing is that the reduction is going on entirely differently here. So remember that in the previous MapReduce architecture, every map worker had to talk to all the reduced workers. So this is no longer the case here. Rather, we have, you know, local maps going on and perhaps even local reduces per machine. And then within the rack, we have reduce going on. And then, you know, all the intermediate per rack level results are sent to this super reducer. So there's a different topology going on here. So what people actually rediscovered with SOSL is list homomorphisms. Uh, what is the list homomorphism? Well, it's a very disciplined um, uh, banana, and it's actually kind of banana we already know. Uh, namely, it's one where we can split up this function from a list to a value uh, 
uh, into a function f that sort of extracts uh, value b from each element and then we have a binary operation to combine intermediate results and of course we have the identity of that binary operation. So h must satisfy these equations, say when we apply h to the empty list it equals the identity, when we apply h to the singleton list it equals the application of this per element level function to x and when h is applied to a non-empty list what we can do is we can just split up uh, the input anywhere in the middle, apply h recursively on the x's and y's and combine the intermediate results with the binary operation. So of course we have a monoid going on here so we can actually uh, set up a scheme of list homomorphisms. So here's our new specification of MapReduce computations and we even give details of all the three levels, you know, machine level, rack level and global level. I mean, as you see, this is much simpler than the specification that we have dealt with previously, right? So this is essentially reduction of, uh, you know, fault map-like reduction as we have discussed it when we were looking into abstract lists. Right, so at the machine level what we do is we go over the input uh, for that machine, you know, which is a list of documents or something like that, and we fold over it and apply the map hand operation in each step, but of course each particular input is processed with F. So we do this data extraction with F. And then at the rack level, you know, we now have a list of lists and so corresponding you know to the inputs that go to the different machines in a rack and you know we perform essentially the first level map reduce per machine and then we just concatenate in a mono idle sense we concatenate all the results coming out of these different machines within the rack and then at the global level you know we just delegate parallelism to all the racks and then again we concatenate in a mono idle sense what's coming out of these racks. Okay? Interesting question is now what is the monoid for counting word occurrences? Right? So because now you know we didn't use monoids previously with the basic specification of MapReduce, we rather used like keyed input and then keyed output and we used uh, key value pairs in between and we used grouping and all that. So we didn't really use monoids explicitly. So now the question with this specification is what is the monoid? Okay, so uh, you know you should just stop here and think a little bit and but I will tell you in a second. But here's a proper exercise. And you might want to you know uh, modify this specification so that you use abstract lists in place of concrete lists which would totally make sense from an implementation point of view because you know in an implementation perhaps these are not quite real concrete lists right you might use other data structures there you might even uh, uh, you know communicate with the file system here so you know there's a good uh, reason for turning this into something that uses abstract lists. Anyway, so what is the monoid for counting word occurrences? Well, here we go. And perhaps not surprisingly, we essentially need a map monoid. I mean, why is that? Well, because we want to compute a word index. So in the end, the, the, the final result of all this is a map, as we uh, showed already with uh, the earlier MapReduce specification. So how do we turn maps into monoids? Well, if you go to the library, you will see that maps already instantiate the monoid type class, but it turns out that we can't use the existing uh, instance. So we have to provide a new instance, and in order to be able to do so, we have to define a new type here. We call this map to monoid. This is our special kind of map for which we know uh, how to use it as a monoid with MapReduce, okay? And here is the monoid instance that we need. So essentially uh, we need to say how we can combine two given maps, right? So what's the challenge about combining two maps? Well, the issue is that the two maps could have overlapping keys in use. So now we need to say what to do if both maps use the same key but different values, right? So what we do there is, and that's the clever thing, we simply assume that the value domain of the map here is also a monoid. So we have nested monoids going on. 
So maps being monoids and the values of the map also being a monoid. So then what we do here is we simply combine the values for the same key from different maps with the binary operation of the monoid for the value domain, right? So that's the trick here. So here's the monoidal code for computing the word index. So what we do is we take the input document and we split it into words uh, as we have done previously. Then we map over these words and we pair up each word essentially with one as we have done previously. However, uh, we need to point out what monoid to use for the emerging uh, map that we want to build, right? I mean, as far as the value domain is concerned. So therefore, we actually associate sum with the count here so that we know that counts have to be summed up. And then for this given document, we just build a tiny map from all these local word occurrence counts. So the result of processing one document is already a monoidal value, say, is already a map. Okay, so this is all one has to specify to implement um, the word index example with the monoidal map reduce, and you still get full parallelism and everything. Okay, so here's an exercise for you. Um, so we just return to a previous exercise where we wanted to combine the word index computation with counting documents. Uh, so this was uh, rather difficult with the previous map reduce specification. So now here it's uh, easy because you know whenever you have to essentially perform two computations with map reduce of that kind, well you can just use the monoid of pairs, right? I mean of course you could always perform like two disconnected map reduce computations even with the other model. But that's of course much less efficient. So we want to uh, combine both and you know please try to work out this solution and please try to figure out how monoids on pairs work. So we are done with list processing. So we want to process other sorts of data types. In fact let's say we want to deal with large bananas and by this I mean that we want to fold over terms of data types that have potentially many constructors. So for example, consider this abstract syntax here of lambda terms, you know, you have variables, you have lambda abstractions, you have function applications, and maybe you have several other uh, constructors in that abstract syntax definition. Well, I mean, or think of COBOL or Java, they even have many data types and each of these data types may have many constructors. So suppose we want to fold over such uh, terms, right? And it turns out that dealing with large bananas uh, is a little bit similar to uh, the visitor pattern in uh, OO programming, but I don't make this link more explicit here. Rather, I invite you to consider this an exercise to figure out this connection. Okay, so large bananas are essentially folds that have to deal with potentially many constructors. So here's an example where we perhaps want to have such a large banana. So, you know, this is an interpreter for this uh, abstract syntax of lambda terms. So we define a function that takes a term and it uses an environment to possibly return a value, right? And so this function is defined by case discrimination on all these lambda terms. And so we basically um, interpret these lambda terms and on the right hand side we may recurse into subterms of the left hand side pattern. Okay, and because we only recurse into subterms that we readily extracted from the left hand side patterns, we say that this interpreter is in the compositional style. So we like compositional style for interpreters because it helps us understanding the meaning of constructs solely in terms of the uh, meanings of the subconstructs. And so um, this is a little bit like a list processing where we say, hmm, we don't want to use general recursion, rather we would like to use fold R or map where applicable because that makes us understand the recursion uh, of over the list uh, in more regular terms 
And so then we also can leverage additional algebraic properties and all this in reasoning about our programs. So we would like to convert this interpreter so that it uses a fold kind of operation rather than general recursion. This is our plan. So in order to do a fold for lambda terms, we need to somehow set up the components for the various constructors of the abstract syntax. You know, compare this with uh, list processing. The fold R operator receives two arguments saying how to replace the empty list constructor and how to replace the non-empty list constructor. Now, when we want to fold over lambda terms, we have to say how to replace all the various kinds of constructors that we have. So we actually group these components in a record type here, in a product essentially. So we say how to replace a lambda variable, we say how to replace a lambda abstraction, and so forth. And what we do is we basically get the type of these components from the type of the constructor, except that we have to replace the recursive reference to the data type in question, say term, by some type variable that proxies for the result of folding. Okay? And so then once we have such a term algebra, essentially just a bunch of functions that we should apply when replacing constructors along folding, well then indeed we can define this fold operation. So fold term takes such an algebra and it takes a term and then it performs uh, case discrimination on those uh, terms and it performs of course recursion so here it recurses into the subterms with f and then uh, it combines the intermediate results with components it looks up from the algebra so for example when it processes a lambda abstraction it recurses into the body of the lambda abstraction and then it combines the, um, the verbal of the lambda abstraction and the recursively processed body of the lambda abstraction with the lambda component from the algebra, right? Okay, so now we have totally isolated the scheme of recursion, uh, the compositional scheme of recursion over lambda terms. Now we can redefine our interpreter uh, to use fold. Okay, so what we have to do essentially is we have to define an appropriate fold algebra for the interpreter. So we first have to figure out what the result type of the fold should be and that should be basically this function type here. So it's a function from environments to maybe a value, right? And then the components of the fold algebra are directly uh, derived, you know, from uh, what was the right hand side in the earlier interpreter, right? So, except that we don't have to carry out any recursion here in this setup because that's what the fold operation does for us. So when we, for example, process a lambda abstraction, we get a lambda verbal here and we get a readily recursively processed body of the lambda abstraction here, okay? So that's nice. So we basically now have a fold algebra which doesn't do any recursion by itself, which in fact doesn't talk about syntax at all. Okay, so this is very much like doing list processing with fold R, right? Let's look at another example. So here's an operation for free variable analysis. And we also want to turn this uh, function into a function that uses fold eventually. So, how is this free verbal analysis defined? Well, again, by case discrimination on all the patterns, uh, on all the constructs of lambda terms. And for example, when we have a, a verbal here, a lambda verbal, that then it, it occurs that this is a free verbal, right, just by itself. Or if we have a lambda abstraction, well, then we first compute the free verbals for the body of the lambda abstraction. And then we delete from this set um, the variable x that is bound by this lambda abstraction, right? If we have function application, we obtain the set of free variables from the function application simply as the union of the free variables from uh, both parts of the function application. Or if we have the zero construct, well, this is just, you know, there's no variables in there, so the empty set has to be returned. And we keep on going like this, right? 
So now we can actually um, turn this into a fold algebra. I mean, we simply really just exploit the fact here that the free verbal analysis was defined in a compositional style. Otherwise, we would have a hard time uh, rewriting it to a fold algebra. Okay, so what do we do here? Uh, the result type of this fold algebra is now a set of names. And you see, uh, we associate the singleton construction with the component for lambda variables. We associate the delete function with the lambda component, zero, uh, we associate with the empty set, and so on and so forth, right? So in this manner, we now have uh, replaced uh, generally recursive, but uh, intended to be compositional definition of free variable analysis by this fold algebra. Now, we can make an interesting observation. Uh, say we can look at this uh, list here of the components and we will see uh, that essentially, I mean there are exceptions, but essentially we are combining intermediate results by union. I mean, uh, this is certainly the case here, right? We combine it with union. It's also the case here that we combine it with union. And all these cases here with ID are not really an exception. I mean, there's nothing to be combined, okay? And here, it's also not an exception, right? There's simply nothing to be returned at all. So the only exceptions seem to be these two guys here. Um, anyway, so essentially, we are combining intermediate results by union. Now, our mono idle sense uh, kicks in and tells us, hey, there's some mono idle style computation going on here. Namely, essentially, intermediate results are combined by a binary operation of a monoid, being a union in the case of the monoid of sets. Okay, so what we can do is we can actually set up a sort of a generic fold algebra that does just that. I mean, it just combines everything through union. Well, we don't have to be specific to sets. No, we, indeed, we rather generalize to do this for any possible monoid. So you see how we do this. For variables, well, we just return the identity element of the monoid. I mean, simply because there are no recursive results that we could, you know, uh, return or combine. For lambda abstractions, well, there's only one recursive position for this constructor, and that's the second one. That's the constructor position for bodies. Well, we just return that position. And then for apply, we have two parameters in the constructor. Well, we just combine them with map and. For zero, there's nothing at all, M empty. For suck, well, there's just one. And for pad, just one argument position. We just return that intermediate result right away. And for cont, uh, for if, so to say, we have like three positions and we just uh, apply map and twice. <clears throat> So this is a monoidal fault algebra that just applies aggressively the binary operation where possible. Now, with this uh, monoidal fault algebra in place, we can actually write down our fault algebra for free variable analysis much more concisely. So what we do is we take this monoidal algebra and we just refine it, we just customize it. Namely, we just specify those cases that are not already okay. Right? So it turns out we have to say something for uh, lambda variables and for lambda abstractions. All the other cases are just fine. Okay? So for you know, lambda variables, we just have to override uh, you know, that it says empty in the mono idle algebra. We have to say, no, we just want to return this specific um, variable. And then for lambda abstractions, we have to override the behavior that we do not simply return the recursive result from the body. No, we actually also delete the lambda variable at hand. Okay, so, but the point here is we have sort of uh, developed this full algebra now in a staged manner, right? So we have observed that it essentially falls some mono idle style of computation. And then we have said, okay, we can just customize this mono idle style in like two places. And this is our entire problem specific specification of free verbal analysis. Okay. So here's a little exercise for you. Uh, you know, you might want to design an algebra for mapping rather than 
uh, reduction. I mean, like uh, the monoidal algebra basically serves for reduction. So you could also come up with such a generic algebra for mapping, you know, that basically reconstructs a term. And then uh, you could try to use that uh, generic fold algebra in a tiny program transformation. You know, you have to come up with some little uh, scenario of program transformation, perhaps some, you know, simplification of lambda terms or whatever. And so please try to come up with that algebra and with a use of it, uh, a problem-specific program transformation. So in the last part of the lecture, I want to introduce the scrap your boilerplate approach to generic functional programming to you. And in a way, we already started to do generic programming because we were talking about these generic fold algebras. And so this will just uh, advance this topic a little bit more. And again, folds will play a major role in this. Uh, so in spaceflight, you know, boilerplate refers to a kind of a testing capsule as opposed to the real rocket. But when we say boilerplate or boilerplate code in programming, then we mean boring code. And this approach here, scrap your boilerplate, uh, tries to avoid such boring code. Anyway, so here's an example that makes it clear. So suppose you need to total all the salaries in a company like this. So you have, you know, companies, you have departments, possibly nested departments, you have managers, you have other employees. So you need to get over this uh, company term and total all the salaries. So you want a function total that returns the total, okay? So if you approach this uh, problem in a standard manner, well, then you will end up writing boilerplate code. So you will write a function total, takes a company, returns a float. And so at the top level, it needs to go over all the departments in the company and then sum up all the intermediate results. And then it needs to say how we process departments. And so we pattern match departments we access the salary of the employee, sorry, the manager, and we also try to get all the salaries, all the totals, subtotals for the subunits. And this is how we access the salary of an employee. This is how we subtotal the uh, subunits. And there's again some pattern matching and some recursion involved. And this is lots of boilerplate code. And there's very little interesting code here, this one namely. And other than that, it's like one function per type and one case per constructor. So we would like to write much less code. We would like to take much less dependency on the details of the company data structure. Um, so you might want to refine just to better understand boilerplate code, this function here, so that it returns, uh, let's say, only manager salaries. Okay. So here's the data types that we used. Um, this just shows uh, what sort of heterogeneity we have to uh, deal with. I mean, so, you know, there are many types and some of the types may have many constructors. We may have nesting, like in this case, departments are nested. We may even have like arbitrary mutual recursion. We may also have some amount of structural typing as opposed to nominal typing, like in this case, you know, salaries don't reveal themselves by a designated type, they are just floats. And so we need to be able to process terms of such heterogeneous types. Okay, so here's another example. So we want to cut salaries by half. You know, we don't want to total them, rather we want to transform a company term so that all salaries are divided by two. Okay, so again, we have to define one function per type and one case per constructor. And again, there's very little interesting code down here, namely where we end up dividing salaries by two. And so we would like to do better than this. So this is how we do total and cut with SYB style of generic programming. It's much less code and it's very easy to explain. So the key idea is that we use traversal schemes such as everything and everywhere. So these traversal schemes allow us to get to all the possible subterms of all possible types within the root term. So in this case, let's say we want to compute total. And so what we need to do is we need to get to all the salary subterms. And uh, all these traversal schemes always take some argument function 
to be applied to the subterms that we find. So, you know, with total, we want to basically try to extract flows, that is salaries, from all the subterms. So therefore, this needs to be a generic function that extracts floats. This is also clear from the type here. So how do we construct this generic function? Well, we start from a generic default that returns constantly zero, no matter the term, no matter the type. And then we customize it by a type-specific case. So if we hit a float, then we return it with this type-specific version of the identity function. Okay, so in this manner we get lots of flows for all the subterms in our company term, which we then sum up with binary addition. So the whole scheme is very similar to fold map, you know, of the foldable class, except that we now go over the term deeply as opposed to a list. Okay, so cut. Uh, you know, that one should transform a company term and it uses a different traversal scheme everywhere. That traversal scheme actually transforms. So also its argument function is supposed to transform. So this argument function again is a generic function that can basically deal with terms of arbitrary types. And so we start uh, from the polymorphic identity function and we customize this function to actually divide floats by two as we hit them. Okay, so this is how we program with SYB style. We use traversal schemes to get to all the terms of interest and we use generic functions that we uh, customize in appropriate ways so that we can query or transform subterms of interest. All right, so let's look at the ingredients here a little bit more. So this is how XT, for example, is defined. This is the constructor for generic transformations. So the idea is that we provide it with a first argument that is the generic default. You know, this is the transformation to be applied if the type specific case, that is the second argument, is not applicable. And in the end, we have to transform some incoming X. This is a polymorphic argument. This could be a term of any type. So how do we find out whether to apply G or S? Well, that's rather simple. Once we allow ourselves a cost operation. So what we do here is we just take the type specific case S and we try to cost it to something that could be indeed applied to the incoming X. So this cost, as usual, might succeed or it might fail. If it fails, then obviously X and S do not agree on the type, and so we have to resort to the polymorphic generic default G, which can cope with any possible X. And if the cost succeeded, we get a costed S prime, and that one then can be applied to X. Okay. So, and this can also be done like that for XQ, say when we need to construct generic queries. Okay, so how do we go about generic traversal schemes? So these are actually the definitions of everywhere and everything as they occur in the Haskell library. And so what we do here is we basically take an argument function, you know, like the generic transformation or here a generic query, and so we just apply this layer by layer to the nested term. And so we use special one layer traversal primitives uh, that actually iterate a given function over the immediate subterms of a term. And so these are the real working horses of the approach. So let's understand this in all detail. So what we do here is when we do everywhere, say when we want to transform at all levels, well, we first recursively apply the traversal to the immediate subterms of the given term. So this is exactly what GMAPT is supposed to do. You know, it takes a function and applies it to all the immediate subterms of the given term, just as if we were doing a list map. Well, in addition, GMAPT also reconstructs a term with the same outermost constructor as the incoming term. So and then it just puts back all these processed immediate subterms. Well, this is what we do first. We process the subterms and then we apply the argument transformation to the root term. Okay, And then with everything, it's quite similar except that we need to carry out queries. 
Well, so we use GMAPQ rather than GMAPT. So GMAPQ is defined to apply an argument function to all the immediate subterms and to collect all these immediate results in a list. And then, as you see, we uh, apply an ordinary fold in order to reduce that list and also to apply the query function f to the root of the list. Okay. So let me provide a bit more detail here. Let me also show you the types that are going on here. So we use two type synonyms. We use the type synonym generic t for generic transformations and generic q for generic queries. I mean, what are generic transformations? These are simply functions from A to A. And, well, in order to be allowed to perform traversal, we have to constrain the type A uh, to be an instance of the data class. In this manner, we are allowed to perform traversal. So a generic query instead, you know, for some given result type R of the query, is a function, a polymorphic function from A to R. Okay, so now it, it's also clear what the types of these traversal schemes are. You know, everywhere is basically uh, a transformer from uh, generic transformations uh, to generic transformations, right? So it takes a generic transformation, you know, to be applied to all subterms and it turns it into a generic transformation that actually performs traversal. And the same here, you know, everything, we give it an argument function that is a generic query, you know, that can be applied to every subterm to extract the value of type R. And then what it does is it completes that generic query into a traversing generic query. Uh, and to this end, it also uses the binary operation on R here. So now what remains is to understand or to, to actually clarify how GMAP T and GMAP Q are defined. You know, these are the working horses that make generic traversal schemes work, and there are a few more like this. So, well, I don't give you the real code because it's a little bit intricate and it wouldn't fit on the slide, but actually what, what they are defined like is really like this. You know, GMAP T takes an argument function f and is applied to a term with this with these immediate subterms T1 to Tn. And then what it does is it constructs a term with the same outermost constructor and it replaces, so to say, the original terms by the processed uh, terms. Okay, so you see this is really very much like an ordinary map. And this one is also like a map, the GMAP Q, except that we don't reconstruct a term, but we construct a list from all those immediate uh, results. Now the cool thing is, and you might uh, want to read about this, I'll give you further reading pointers in a second, is that these two guys are derived from one more general uh, G fold L primitive. So basically there is like the mother of all traversal uh, called G fold L, and so everything in SYB is based on G fold L. And you know, so this also explains why uh, SYB is all about bananas. In the end, it all derives from a single default L primitive for folding over the immediate subterms of a term. So let me wrap up here. Uh, we are at the end. Here are some further reading pointers. Uh, I guess most of them have been mentioned throughout the presentation. So let me just be quick here. And thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you soon again.